In this video, I will be interviewing Braden Sky, who scaled from doing zero to over 100K per month on Amazon in just nine months. Braden's business model is online arbitrage, and he also does it from halfway around the world while he's traveling in places like Chiang Mai and Bali, but I'll let him tell his story. So without further ado, here's the interview. So I brought you on today because I think you have a really interesting story. Plus you were the first person to interview me on YouTube. So I definitely wanted to return the favor, but for all of those who are not familiar with you, why don't you go ahead and give like a one to two minute backstory? Yeah. So, uh, my name is Braden Sky right now. I'm a six figure, uh, Amazon seller doing online arbitrage. I've been, uh, successfully selling on Amazon since 2023 and unsuccessfully selling on Amazon since 2018. In uh, 2017, like a bunch of other people, I read the four hour work week and decided that that is uh, how I wanted to live my life. So went on YouTube, how to make money online, found the same clickbait videos as everyone else, uh, found a course to teach me private label. Um, I launched that with, uh, with a bunch of debt and that business uh, got basically zero sales, lost a ton of money. I know you had a similar experience. Um, after that, while I was uh, paid off the debt for uh, about two and a half years, uh, I was living out of a, <clears throat> a tent, a car, and then an RV. Um, so dep whether or not you want to call that homelessness, it's up to you. Um, and then after COVID, I uh, got some unemployment money, uh, started traveling, and haven't stopped since. Um I started a Facebook marketplace dropshipping business and ran that for two years, scaled that up to $2 million per year within the first year, and then down to $0 in the second year. Uh, right after that, I made the transition to doing online arbitrage on Amazon, which is where I'm at right now. And what are your monthly numbers looking for on the business that you started less than six months ago? So right now, my trailing 30-day revenue is about Fifty-five thousand um, dollars, and that's at a hundred fifty percent month-over-month growth. Um, and I'm looking for that to uh, keep scaling up. Uh, maybe not at a hundred fifty percent growth, uh, but definitely around at least fifty percent month-over-month growth. Yeah. So, what got you into online arbitrage? You've definitely done a lot of different business models, and you know, going from drop shipping to online arbitrage is not typically a route that you see. Um, so for people watching, if you don't mind giving like a brief explanation on how you found it and also just what online arbitrage is. Yeah. So with, uh, my Facebook marketplace dropshipping business, it was a massive operation and, and we were doing really well, but then I saw the writings on the walls and I basically knew the business was going to fail, um, from the start of 2022. So I spent the whole year, um, trying to figure out what my next business model was going to be. I was thinking it was going to be maybe wholesale drop shipping, maybe doing retail drop shipping on eBay or Poshmark or Mercari or all those platforms. I looked into affiliate marketing. I looked into um, starting like a social media marketing agency or, or like a um, like, like an ads agency. I was watching some videos about that. None of it clicked. Uh, then I, uh, <clears throat> I posted the interview that I did with you. And from that, I found Oscar Martinez and Side Hustle Experiment. Um, shout out to both of them. I started following them on Instagram and one day I was sitting in a hammock in Columbia and I I actually looked into what they were doing and the day I did that um I decided I'm I'm going to do this and um I interviewed Oscar on my channel uh then basically right away he told me like um what I'll tell the audience is if you put in the work you will succeed with the business model there's so much opportunity that um, if you're trying to make money online, if you're trying to, um, work remotely, um, a hundred percent, if you're willing to put in the work and you're willing to learn the business model, uh, it will be successful, um, which most business models are definitely not like that. Um, so once I heard that, I heard it from, I heard the same thing from my other business partner. Um, he ended up finding the same business model independently of me told me it was a hundred percent chance of success. And and from there I was a hundred percent committed with a zero uh, plan for anything else. Yeah. And I think online arbitrage is a unique business in that, in that with affiliate marketing or SMMA or any other business model, I've never personally done them, but there's no direct output that you can look and say, okay, this is earning X amount of dollars. If I do this, it'll be a direct correlation of my action versus with Amazon. You know that 
you have the data, if you buy X product or, you know, you receive X product in inventory, you can sell it and you can see the price. You can see the demand, the supply um, of your competition. And it's such a unique business model in that you have all this data, not even like big box retail stores like Walmart or Target predict that they have to look at how many people live in the area. Amazon just such a unique business model in that essence. Yeah. And with the, uh, you know, tools like Kiba, which is like $20 a month, you can, and I also use like seller app. I recommend that there's some other similar ones. Um, you can, you can look at an Amazon listing. You can say, Hey, this product sells 300 times per month and there's 10 sellers. So if I was to, you know, put my inventory, if I was to buy this product and, and send it into Amazon, I would expect, you know, you look at the buy box rotation and you can get a very accurate, um, guess as to how many it's going to sell in a, as long as you do your keeper research, you can get a very accurate representation into what price it's going to sell at. Um, obviously, there is risk with the online arbitrage compared to drop shipping because you're actually buying the inventory and some of the products guaranteed are going to drop in price because the supply is going to exceed the demand and the, the price is going to go down. They call it price taking. Um, so that happens no matter how experienced of a seller you are. Um, but as you become more experienced and as you get better at product sourcing, the amount of leads that tank get lower and lower and the amount of leads that do amazing get higher and higher. Yeah. And I think also the amount of leads that tank, even if it remains the same, your amount of winning products, your percentage of that increases. So let's say your first product's a tanking product. Even if your next one is whatever your third, let's say your fourth one's a hit, fifth one's a hit. You learn from those mistakes and it's, you know, it compounds. Once you learn what to look for, and you learn, okay, maybe I bought too many. Maybe I didn't look at the history long enough. Um, you, it's a business where you can start with a really low investment. Um, there is a ceiling to it, but it's, it's a very simple and quick way for beginners to get their feet wet with not only Amazon, but just online business in general. Yeah, and I'll actually explain the business model uh, real quick because I didn't answer that in your last question. Basically, for people that are listening that don't know what online arbitrage is, um, it's where you're doing FBA or FBM. Um, you're finding products where there's a disparity in between the price that you can buy it at and the price that you can sell it at on Amazon. Um, sometimes that disparity is caused by products going on sale. Um, so, you, you know, you would look at, hey, we have a clearance sale. There's a thousand products. You look through a thousand of them, five of them are profitable and you buy those five. Or there's other products that you can buy at MSRP which is like the, um, the the base price that you can buy at any store. And then you sell it at a premium. Uh, I have some products like that where I'm, I'm not using any coupon codes or anything. And there's other products depending on the retailer where you can use uh, coupon codes, cash back, gift cards, um, and loyalty rewards to basically manufacture a margin uh, where there otherwise wouldn't be. So with a very slight uh, discrepancy in between prices, you can find... Uh, products where you can buy for, let's say, um, fifty dollars, and you sell it for ninety dollars, and then it's profitable. Um, there's there's a lot of different ways to do it, but basically, what you're doing is you're just um, solving the inefficiencies in the market. And do you think it's more scalable than drop shipping, or do you think it's less scalable? Do you think like you know, do you want to be doing this? for a bit more, or do you have like aspirations to get the wholesale? You know, like we were saying before the call, I think next year. Uh, I'm very strongly considering looking into wholesale drop shipping. Um, obviously, your audience is familiar that that's what you do. Um, the reason I would want to do that is because the uh, the main bottleneck that I see with online arbitrage, the two big ones are either leads or capital. You have um, more capital than the amount of leads that you have to buy, or you have more leads to buy than the amount of capital that you have. Um, but I think once you get good at product sourcing um your bottleneck is always going to be capital um meaning you know even if you're like for me for example right now i'm spending about uh fifteen thousand dollars per week on inventory um just because that's me really pushing the extent of the credit cards that i have the credit lines and the amex platinum that i'm using to try to get as much inventory as i can but i know that i could be doing yeah i love it especially because I can use uh, $400 per month for the Dell credit to buy Amazon inventory. But, you know, like I could spend $25,000 a week right now. I had the leads to be able to do that, um, which would be roughly $200,000 per month in revenue. I just, I need the, the capital. 
Um, so definitely the big bottleneck with uh, online arbitrage and wholesale, uh, which I think are actually really similar business models. Um, the the bottleneck is definitely capital. Um, I think wholesale dropshipping is is a lot better on capital if you have a lot more time um, that you're willing to invest in the wholesale dropshipping. You really don't need that much capital because you just need to buy your Seller Central account, buy a Keepa, um, and once you actually get a sale, then you put, you know, then then you then you use your capital. But it's not like you're putting your capital at risk and you're not. Um, putting your capital into Amazon and hoping that it's gonna, uh, you know, hoping that your inventory is gonna do well, which it doesn't always do. Yeah. Um, what I would say is that wholesale drop shipping definitely seems really intimidating, which is why I, you know, even though I was watching a bunch of your videos, I didn't actually start wholesale drop shipping. I think I might have contacted a couple suppliers, and you know, right as I was in the process of doing that, is when I learned about online arbitrage. Um, whereas online arbitrage or retail arbitrage, um, you could learn about, let's say retail arbitrage, which is where you're doing online arbitrage, but in person, you go to a store, you find a clearance rack, you buy the product. Um, you, I, I've talked to people that have done, you know, they're, they're doing a thousand dollars a day in their first week of learning about the business where they didn't know, you know, how Amazon worked, you know, last Monday, it's this Monday and they've already done a couple thousand dollars in sales. Um, there are definitely, you know, exceptions to the rule, but it, it definitely is possible to to do that. Um, whereas wholesale drop shipping, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, you have to make a lot of phone calls to be able to find the suppliers. And then even then you have to talk to them as if you know what you're doing. And as a beginner with wholesale drop shipping, you kind of don't, which is why it intimidated me. And it's a good point. I think when I, I got started, um, I took a similar route. I didn't get started with wholesale drop shipping. I got started with private label and that crashed and burnt. So that experience led to me. Um, it was a blessing in disguise. I learned how to do Amazon and I was able to turn that into uh, another business that is profitable. So with wholesale drop shipping, I think you're right. Um, a lot of people who I talk to, it's intimidating, not only um, just because selling on Amazon, which can be intimidating for beginners, but also, man, just going to suppliers. Um, I think like getting over that hurdle of sending that first email sending that call, those are definitely barriers to the industry versus with retail arbitrage or online arbitrage. You're just like ordering a product from a retail store as normal. And yeah. you know the, the barriers of entry definitely are perceived barriers of entry, not really real barriers of entry. Because I mean, if you're good at, uh, you'll have to believe it, but if you're good at bullshitting, you can call a hundred suppliers today, you know, this afternoon and convince them to sell uh, to you, you know, if you call a hundred, what you think you'll get one or two. So I take a different approach with wholesale drop shipping. to me in the beginning, it was definitely a time factor. My initial investment was the $40 a month for the Amazon, uh, account, but also when you go to a supplier, initially I would just contact everyone. I think there's a little bit more of a method of, okay, I'm only going to refine my searches to ones that are turning up wholesalers or ones that are turning up drop shipping. I think in the beginning, I went to every industry and I would just ask every supplier, but I started to notice that more suppliers were in um, automotive that were drop shipping or home decor or restaurant equipment or something that I sold for a little bit. And within these industries, it just tends to be that a lot of them drop ship more often than other ones. So for suppliers or distributors that sell clothing, the margins just aren't there to, or or the, they're selling too many products. If you're selling a thousand units mm -hmm. of shirts for different SKUs and, and customers are buying huge orders, you know, you're not going to break it down a pallet to take one shirt and then drop ship it. Cause the amount of um, boxing and, and packaging material and labor and, and, and warehouse space for that doesn't equal enough of an investment for them. And versus someone who is a home decor distributor, their larger pieces, you know, that they are easier or just more feasible to be able to drop ship. So that's kind of how I saw it. So I actually, um, I'm in both of my businesses that I have, I niche down and within those niches, they are perfectly suitable for drop shipping. It doesn't mean to say that you need to have a niche. I just think that with wholesale drop shipping, if you're getting started, I tend to try and like find a niche or try and find one supplier. And then those are also contact points. So with each supplier, I'm sure it's similar to retail arbitrage or online arbitrage. When you find like one product on one supplier, I don't know if maybe that supplier has like more products in that category for me with wholesale. Mm -hmm. It's like 
you know, encoding the nodes, you know, everything reaches out to, to another one. It's just different contact points. So like, once you find one, you can go ahead and ask that supplier, Hey, um, do you guys have any uh, referrals for other brands or, or other products that you carry? Maybe, you know, distributors in the area that you sell to. Um, so you can go ahead and contact them. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the the same way with pretty much any business model. Um, I'll drop a couple golden nuggets here just in case anyone is actually looking to get like a start. You could go to websites like uh, Glossier, uh, G-L-O-S-S-I-E-R, or Nature Sunshine. And you can just look at the products that they have on those websites. Um, and you can look at the price they have on Amazon. Uh, check Retail Me Not or check Keepa, uh, or sorry, check uh, Cupert. And, you know, run a scan for the coupon, see what kind of percentage off you can get. And then you can just look at the the, the price differences. Uh, but let's say you found one product uh, from one of those suppliers. Let's say it's like the uh glossier bomb.com uh you can just go and just immediately look at that website and check all of their products which for me i think is the best way to do it is to um you know you find a supplier that is good or that looks promising check every single one of their products you'll find some winners for sure and that's the same in wholesale you know once you find like one not every product is going to be a winner but it tends to be that once you find one supplier who carries let's say i contact the supplier who has a specific product they tend to have more products that I'm going to be interested in. Um, and I'm curious on your research process for products. Are you using um, software in it or is it mostly manual? I know a lot of people um, are starting to hate on tactical arbitrage that you can't really find profitable products. So I'm not too familiar with the landscape for software in the online arbitrage space. Yeah, so I would actively disencourage anybody from using tactical arbitrage. Um, I'm sure there are some ways that you could use it to find uh you know, like I'm sure you could use like tactical expander, or tactical bucket to create your own X path and, you know, map out a website to be able to, you know, map out a website that isn't tactical arbitrage compliant to be able to work within tactical arbitrage. But that's not beginner friendly. Um, when I first got into online arbitrage as a beginner, I was using tactical arbitrage, um, which for those that don't know, it's basically a software that scans some really big retailers. Um, and looks for price disparities, and then you can put in what coupons you have or what cash back you have, what ROI you're looking for, and what BSR you're looking for, uh, bestseller rank, if you're not familiar with the terms I'm throwing out. But then it'll just spit out a, a bunch of products, and you can look and see if they're profitable. The problem with that, though, is everyone is seeing the exact same products, and when everyone is seeing the same products, everyone buys them, uh, everyone sends them in, and although it looks really good on the Keepa, um, a bunch of people sending the product, supply outweighs demand, the price drops, and nobody makes any money. So I wasted like two and a half months uh, as my first couple months in the business uh, sourcing through tactical arbitrage. And I, I can honestly say, like, unless you really know what you're doing in terms of using tactical bucket or tactical expander, which are different programs which go off the back of tactical arbitrage, I would say. Don't even try tactical arbitrage. It's it's way too saturated, and you're gonna lose more money and time than it's worth. I don't think they're gonna be sponsoring my channel now. <laughs> Probably not. I wouldn't want them to sponsor it anyway. It's okay. I don't <laughs> even do online arbitrage. I think that you know your your way of doing it is also um, similar to how Oscar and other people. I think you're more manual approach. I start with reverse sourcing, which is where you look at uh, stores that you know, are doing online arbitrage and you just take a peek in their store and see what kind of brands they're selling, uh, see what kind of products they have and see what kind of suppliers they're buying those products from. And for beginners, it's definitely better to start with reverse sourcing because then you can see, you know, what kind of brands are out there. Like Glossier, I didn't know they existed before I did online arbitrage, it's like a big makeup brand. Nature Sunshine, I didn't know they existed. They're like a supplement company. And I wouldn't recommend actually buying either of those two because all of those uh, products have, are pretty much guaranteed to tank. But you can use that to you know, see what other people are selling. And then from there, you can find new suppliers, new websites, and uh, then do what's called manually sourcing, which is where you check every single product on that website. And um, I don't think that I've met or talked to a single seven-figure seller so far that isn't doing manual sourcing. So of all the seven figure sellers I've talked to, including Oscar, when you ask them what's their sourcing method, they say manual sourcing. It's because all the money is to be made in things that other people aren't willing to do. So whenever there's like a something that looks like a cheat code, like tactical arbitrage, you want to stay away from it. 
Yeah. When there's a catalog with a thousand products and you can't run it through a UPC scanner, that's where the money is to be made. So manual sourcing is definitely the best way to uh, to find products. I think objectively. I do agree. I was a little bit in denial and I would still use a UPC um, scanner as my main product research method for finding wholesalers. Um, but Oscar also convinced me to go on the train of like less, less technology um, as everyone's doing AI, everyone's using ChatGPT. The problem is when you're using these software, so software like Keepa, software um, like um, Seller, Amp, Seller, um, you know, there, there's so many softwares out there, but essentially mm-hmm. these softwares, they are not giving you products. They're, they're giving you the tools to determine if something is a good buy or, or just the data. They're literally just giving you data on the product. And then it's up to you to make the, the determining factor versus like with, um, with tactical arbitrage, or I think an example that might be familiar with my viewers is smart scout. So smart scout, you can put in the parameters and say, I want products that are doing under 50,000 um, with this X amount of sellers in this category. Everyone who's using Smart Scout is going to get the exact same results. Um, so it, you have to understand that you're seeing the data that other people are seeing as well. So you have to take that into account. And there's no way that you can know how many people are looking at it at the exact same time. Versus if you're doing manual research, there isn't a software out there that's going to be you know, giving other people that data. That data is specific to you as well as anyone else who, who happens to stumble upon it manually. So my process now is I get a wholesale sheet from a supplier. I run it through Scan Unlimited. Um, I've been trying to test out Smart Scout for it as well as like other ones. I still use Scan Unlimited, but I run it through there just to get an idea of the profitability because I have a supplier that I just ran. Uh, their scan had 50,000 um, UPC codes on it. So there's no way, you know, I can scroll through and it's also a distributor. So it's not just like it's a brand. If it is a brand, I just search it up on Amazon and I see what products are selling. Actually use uh, keep a product finder and, and make that process a lot better. Yeah, you can. I tend to just like scan limited because it's simple. It gives you that data. You know, it's also what I'm familiar with. You can use different softwares for it. Whichever one you're going to do, I just run that scan really quickly to just see the simple data on the product. And then from there, I know, okay, these products are doing well. They have brands that are selling. Let's look at the other ones manually. A uh, little advanced strategy you could do too is if you do use Keep a, Pro- uh, Keep a Product Finder as opposed to just searching it on Amazon is you can find products that are currently out of stock. Because if you if you just find a product that, if you just you know Google Amazon or Google a product or search on Amazon um, like a customer would, obviously they're not going to show you any uh, products that you can't buy. But if you use a Keep a Product Finder, then you can find products that have suppressed BSRs uh, or that are currently out of stock and they've been out of stock for let's say three months or six months or a year, then you could buy them, send them in and, and you're the only person on the listing. So yeah, a little advanced sure. strategy there for you. Yeah, I think that's more of a little bit of like a uh, an intermediate strategy is like when you're targeting um, products that are out of stock or suppressed buy box, you know, you can look at um, are the reviews going up? There's a lot of things that you can do right there, but you just want to wait to like, you know, see that data in bulk. Um, and even Oscar still incorporates that and, and you know, even seven figure sellers, like there there's definitely a lack of software, but when you're working with such high volumes, you know, you want to see like immediately, like what, what does the distributor have? Um, so what's your, te- what's your tech stack looking like for uh, your business right now? Are you using Keepa? Are you using like what other software? So I'd say <clears throat> definitely if you're using, if you're doing online arbitrage or wholesale, um, not having Keepa is not even an option, but like, if you say like, well, I can't afford Keepa, it's $20 a month, like find a different business model because okay, you need Keepa. You'd also need to get some type of, uh, not, I guess need, but realistically at, at scale, yeah, you need to have some type of uh, profitability calculator. Uh, my preference is Seller Amp. They also have Rev Seller, Asin Zen, Bybot Pro. I think Bybot Pro might be free. Um, I really like the user interface for Seller Amp, and you can uh, calculate your prep fee and and your inbound shipping uh, prices, and and it shows you all your calculations. So. I think it's like 20 bucks a month. I think that's 100% worth it. So you basically just need those two to start and then obviously a pro seller account so you can get the buy box. But besides that, I mean, you don't really need a ton of tools. Um, As you actually start growing and as you actually have a a decent sized catalog, let's say, you know, 25 to 50 products or more, at that point, you want to get a repricer. I use a seller snap. It's extremely advanced and you do not need it as a beginner. But for that, it's $500 a month. Well worth it for me. But you can get a repricer. I think Be Cool starts at like $20 a month. And I've heard good things about Channel Max. 
Um, and I know that was pretty cheap too, because they, they increase your price as you scale. Yeah, I mean, my operating expenses are, are pretty cheap. You don't really need a ton of softwares. You just go on websites and, and check every product one by one. Do you have any uh, virtual assistants or people helping you out? Yeah, I've got two virtual assistants, um, which is definitely a lot for a company my size. Um, I carried the one virtual assistant over from um, from my last business. He was the general manager, and he was just too good that I couldn't fire when I did. I couldn't lay him off when I did the transition, so I had to keep him, even though it was unprofitable to do so. Uh, then I just had a new VA um, start last week, and he's got a bunch of experience. Um, with sourcing, finding wholesale suppliers, data entry, admin work, uh, and purchasing. So definitely really excited for him. But um, I do also, uh, recently I've been talking to a guy who has two virtual assistants full-time, and he's doing 250000 per month in revenue working uh, 10 hours a week, is what he said. Um, so with online arbitrage, you know, with my Facebook business, I had 25 employees. Um, 25 VAs at, at the peak doing 2 million a year. I think to do 2 million a year in online arbitrage, two to three employees is is plenty. The difference in that is crazy. And I think that, that shows the difference between drop shipping, where you need to have all hands on deck versus online arbitrage, especially when you're buying inventory up in bulk and upfront, you have a lot more control and you don't need as many people on the back end to deal with orders and cancellations and just finding individual products like that. So as a beginner or someone who's getting started with online arbitrage, do you recommend them to hire a virtual assistant towards the beginning or when would you recommend that they make that transition? Uh, definitely, I would not recommend hiring a virtual assistant right off the bat. Um, I see a lot of people, they, they haven't learned how to source yet. It's a skill that you have to acquire and it's a skill that you get exponentially better at the longer you do it. And I've seen some people in some Discord groups where they have like three or four thousand you know, three or five thousand dollars in revenue per month, and they think they need to hire a sourcer. And um, anyone that is honest with them will tell them, "Hey, you don't need to hire a virtual assistant. You need to learn how to source yourself." And ideally, you'll go without having a virtual assistant for as long as possible, because with capital being the main bottleneck, um, if you take away, let's say, five hundred dollars per month um, in capital away from the business, that's money that you're spending on an employee that you could be spending on inventory. So I think when you do reach a scale of let's say at least $10,000 per month, but ideally like $20,000 per month in revenue, there's a lot of admin work that starts to stack up. And I think it's smart to hire a virtual assistant to outsource the admin work first. But then I think you should still be the main sourcer in your company for a really long time, unless you just have stupid amounts of capital and you're looking to scale stupid quickly, um, which there are those people out there. So I don't want to tell them, hey, don't hire you know, a virtual assistant. You can as long as you know what you're doing. When you hire a, a virtual assistant, you got to remember you're hiring a, a person to, to trust you with their income and, and they're in a third world country. So you definitely don't want to hire them and then realize that you're not ready to hire them and, and lay them off in two weeks. You know, yeah. it's something that you should, uh, take really seriously before doing it. Yeah. And I think the way that I heard it best was from Garrett from all at Amazon. You hire a virtual assistant to fill a gap in your business. So if you're maxing yourself out and you know, you're sourcing and you hit a bottleneck, then you need a sourcer. Or if you're doing admin work and that is taking away, you're seeing diminishing results with your sourcing, then you need an admin. So you, you just need to analyze your business and see where can you get to where you're scaling and also where it makes sense, you know, you have enough profit to cover, then you can go ahead and you can look to hire a virtual assistant. But I, I've also seen like people who are doing $3,000 a month in sales uh, and they want a virtual assistant to go ahead and start doing sourcing. Yeah. I think realistically, unless you just have crazy amounts of capital to deploy and you're trying to scale extremely quickly, like I was saying before, if you don't have that situation, you should really try to have at least like $50,000 per month in revenue before you try to hire a sourcer. Because like I said, you know, I've, I've been the main source for my company. Uh, my VA has found a couple leads, but the majority of the spend that I'm putting in has been leads that I found myself. Um, and if I had the capital to do so, if I had the capital to buy the $25,000 a week in inventory that I would want to buy, I could be doing 
$200,000 per month in revenue without a sourcer and literally just having someone to do purchasing and the admin work. So you really want to hold off on getting a sourcer for as long as possible because as the owner, you need to be the one that knows how to source. And you need to be the one that's checking the websites and you need to know which websites are good and which ones aren't. Because if you don't know that, your VA probably won't either. And your business is probably not, I don't, I don't want to say it's going to fail, but there's a lot. I just want to recommend it. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's, that's really good advice. Yep. You need yeah. to learn the skills in your business. Um, especially the skills that make you money. You need to like learn how to source. You need to learn how to. Uh, in wholesale, you know, you need to learn how to contact suppliers. I see a lot of people, they just outsource that. And you'll see people on Instagram share or Twitter sharing, they get emails from these uh, people wanting to join their cut, like their company. And it says, dear, insert your name here. And like the v the virtual assistants <laughs> don't even put in where they're supposed to fill in. Um, so you definitely want to go ahead and all the skills that they're going to be um, using at their disposal are just skills that you're going to essentially be teaching them unless you hire someone who's really knowledgeable, um, which in my experience is not always the case. Usually it's, it's, you have to teach them because they learn it one way and maybe you, you know, you use a different method. So definitely in your business, you want to make sure that you are maxing that out. You want to make sure that you are looking at leads constantly. You want to make sure that you are just understanding how to find profitable products. And then even essentially I see a lot of people when they get virtual assistants, they use those virtual assistants to find the leads and then they approve them. So even then, you know, you're not just usually your first VAs are not going to be purchasing for you. They're just a supplement to go ahead and allow you to get leads that you can look at quicker. Yeah. I mean, I'll give a, an anecdote from earlier today. Um, my main VA hasn't had a day off in, in a while, you know, at least a couple of weeks, but probably realistically, maybe a little more like two months. And today he sent me a bunch of leads that was looking through them. There was maybe 10 of them and like six or seven of them were the wrong product. Like the, the product that we were going to sell and the product that the supplier, that he leaked the supplier to completely different product. One was a 50 milliliter. The other was a 200 uh, and they were like different things. So it's like, you have to, you know, even if they are giving you leads, you still have to go and approve them. And that takes a bunch of time. And when you are approving them, you still need to know how to source in order to know what to look for to approve them or deny them. Another example is he sent me a lead from a retailer. This is a, a big retailer, but the um, product was sold by a third party seller. Um, and you really need to have that attention to detail because if you buy a product from a major retailer, but it's sold by a third party seller, you have no acceptable proof of authenticity. And if you get an authenticity complaint, let's say it, was, it wasn't Walmart, but let's say it is Walmart. Um, if it's sold and shipped by Walmart, you'll pass that authenticity complaint, no problem. But if it's sold by if it's sold on Walmart and shipped by a third party seller, you're gonna lose that authenticity complaint. And you know, with, with account health stuff, account health stuff that can completely ruin your business. So um, if you haven't spent time in the trenches doing the sourcing yourself, you would see that lead, you would look at it, the ROI is good, the profit's good, cool, let's buy 20 units. And it was in a category that I wouldn't expect an authenticity complaint, but if you did get one. Uh, that has the potential to shut your business down because you didn't know what you were doing. Yeah. So from the top down, you you need to develop the skills before you go ahead and you hire someone else to outsource them, especially in, in the early stages of your business. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, you have to be the owner of your business. It's like, I, I like to compare um, any type of e-commerce business because people, you know, they don't view it as a business because it has more of like the view of like a side hustle. But starting an e-commerce business is just like starting a restaurant. And I don't think it's any easier. And it, it, if you had a restaurant and you, let's say you had no experience running restaurants and you have no experience being a bartender, you're not just going to hire a bartender and hope that they know how to do things. You're going to want to know how to bartend yourself to be able to um, know what the bartender is doing correct and incorrect. Um, I guess in theory, you could hire like a really good general manager, but in e-commerce, you're not going to hire a VA that knows your business better than you do. And if you do, it's because you don't know enough about your business. Yeah. I think that's a really good analogy. That was a really good interview. So definitely some actionable tips in here. 
um, for people who are looking to get started. Uh, I'm going to leave your information in the description for anyone who wants to reach out. Definitely go ahead and follow Braden. Follow him on his adventure. He's looking like a new man with his Hawaiian <laughs> shirt and everything else. So where can they find you? So right now I'm uh, taking a little hiatus from social media. Um, just because I don't think it's uh, very good for your mental health. Although I'm sure eventually I will go back on Instagram. You can find me there, uh, instagram.com backslash Braden Sky. Um, then I also have a podcast you could check out, uh, the Braden Sky Show. It's on all platforms that uh, you would expect a podcast to be on. Um, that I actually am going to get some interviews going up soon um, where uh, I'll be interviewing some really successful online arbitrage uh, sellers. Uh, some business owners outside of uh, Amazon and uh, a bunch of other interesting guests. Be sure to go ahead and check him out. He drops insane amount of value as well as he does it all from the comfort of his home in Chiang Mai or Bali or wherever he is Bali. traveling from. Ubud. Ubud right now. <laughs> uh, it might change by the time you're listening. So go ahead and follow him there. And thanks for watching. And I hope to see you guys in the next video. Peace.